Hello and welcome back to All About Russia. My name is Andrew and today we're going to be looking at one of the most notorious ethnic groups within the Russian Federation, the Chechens. The Chechens, or Nokchi in their native language, are a Nak ethnic group who primarily reside in the Republic of Chechnya. There are over 1.4 million Chechens in the Russian Federation alone, with 1.2 million of those residing in Chechnya itself. As one of the most numerous ethnic groups in the Russian Federation, Chechens can also be found in the neighbouring Republic of Dagestan at nearly 100,000 residents, the Republic of Ingushetia, Stavropol Krai, the Rostov Oblast, the Volgograd Oblast, the Astrakhan Oblast, the Tumen Oblast, and of course the capital Moscow. Internationally, the Chechens have a large diaspora and can be found in Turkey, Kazakhstan, Georgia, France, Austria, Belgium, Germany, Jordan, and Syria. The name Nokchi is the indigenous term that the Chechens have for themselves and translates to something along the line of people of the land or people of the Nak. Their ethnonym Chechen comes from the prefix Chi, which in the Chechen language translates to something like inside. This was first recorded in the 16th century by Russian explorers referring to the people who lived in this area as insiders or Chechens. This origin story is by no means certain, but it is certainly plausible as several Chechen settlements do begin with the prefix Chi. Despite being so numerous, the Chechens have no sub-ethos groups. This includes the English, who are a related neighbouring Nak people group. Historically, the English and the Chechens have been seen as two sides of the same coin, much like the Karachi and Balkars or the Kabardians and Cherkes. However, for reasons I will be stating later in this video, I will be treating them as separate people. What is rather unique to Chechen society is the concept of the Tip. A Tip is, in essence, a clan system which descends paternally. Being a part of a Tip is an inherent birthright and comes with certain privileges, such as having a plot in the Tip graveyard, rights to communal land farming, and of course a right to hospitality within and across other Tips, just to name a few. But this belonging does also come with certain obligations, including an obligation to aid in any blood feud that rises across the Tip. Today, there are anywhere between 150 and 300 Tips, as new ones do emerge. Interestingly, the concept seems to have emerged during the time of the Mongol invasions, and it holds the rights to farmland communally among the Tip members. Though this may well be a development from a pre-Mongol municipality system that existed in Chechen society. The importance of the Tip has certainly declined over the last century, but it would be incorrect to say it was purely nominal, as we have seen. Another unique concept in Chechen society is that of the Tukum. This too allegedly emerged around the time of the Mongol invasions and works in similar terms to an alliance. This idea has been misapplied to many Chechen Tips over the years, falsely portraying it as a wider Tip system. When in reality, it was an alliance system formed temporarily for mutual defense and security. Famously, this would also be made with outsiders, notably Dagestani clans. The Chechen language is widely spoken across the Chechen population, both within Chechnya and across the diaspora. It is in the Vainik branch of the Nak branch of the North Caucasian family tree. It is an official language in Chechnya, and those who speak it have a passive bilingualism with neighbouring English. Within the Chechen language, there are two main dialects and several sub-dialects. Chechen dialects can be broken down into highland and lowland dialects, with several sub-dialects between each of these. The latter is the literary dialect of Chechen, though both dialects are reasonably comprehensible to the other. Chechen was first in written form somewhere around the 16th century, though there are claims of petroglyphs or Proto-Georgian script being used prior to the Mongol invasions. Written Chechen in the 16th century used an Arabic script developed from Muslim missionaries. During the 19th century, two separate scripts for Chechen were developed, an adapted Arabic-inspired script used in 1810 by the Chechen elite, and a Cyrillic script 
used in 1862 and developed by Russian officer Baron Uslar. Due to war and exile, neither script took firm root in Chechen society. And in 1910, Sergei Gesunov adapted Chechen again, using another adapted Arabic script, but was more successful and was widely used across Chechnya. As with other indigenous languages across the Soviet Union, Chechen received a Latin script in 1920, followed by a Cyrillic script in 1938. This is the script still used today, although during the 1990s, another attempt at a Latin-inspired script was used, primarily because the Cyrillic script lacked certain elongated distinctions that Latin could provide. This latter script was adopted by President Dudayev, but was not particularly popular and today is only used by a handful of the diaspora. As a Vainic people, the origins of the Chechens are rather murky. We have evidence of human settlement in modern Chechnya from around 40,000 years ago, but we cannot be sure that these were the modern Chechen people. Whilst many claim they are indigenous to the Caucasus, some claim that the Chechens, along with the English and other Vainic peoples, arrived in the North Caucasus around 10,000 BC, arriving from the Fertile Crescent of the South. Still, others claim that these are the survivors of the Kingdom of Uratu in modern Armenia, who fled the Sumerian invasion of the 7th century BC. Irrespective of their true origins, our first written records of the Chechens comes from the Greek historian Strabo, who recorded the Nakchoi as residing in modern Chechnya around 7 BC. Interestingly, he also recorded the Galgai, residing in a neighbouring vicinity, the indigenous term for the Ingush. This provides the first of several references that suggest that the Chechens and the English are in fact two separate people from one common origin, much like the Swedes and Danes, Indians and Pakistanis, or Russians and Ukrainians. By the 5th century BC, Georgian records cite the Zerduketians as living in Chechnya. This was, by Georgian records, a Vainic state, allegedly formed around 1000 BC. As we mentioned in our video on the Chechen Republic, as well as in our video on the English Republic, a degree of intermarriage between the Georgian elite and Zerduketian aristocracy occurred. There is a debate of the degree of Georgian influence on the Chechens, as well as the extent of Zerduketia itself, with another state, called Malk, being set up further west near the Bosporan Kingdom, and claimed by many to be another proto chechen state. From the 6th century BC, the Zerduketians faced invasion from the north and successive waves of Scythians and later Alanians caused the feudal state to centre around what we consider the North Central Caucasus. By the 3rd century BC, a detente of sorts had been reached, with records of Vainic communities living in, of course, the Duketia, but as well in neighbouring Alania and Georgia. An interesting tidbit is that the Duketia was not the only Vainic state existing at this time. As we mentioned to the west, the state of Malk existed, which was a kingdom bordering the Bosporan Kingdom. There is some debate as to whether they were of the same ethnic stock as the Duketians, but Georgian sources suggest that they certainly were. As much of this history of the Chechen people was poorly recorded, if recorded at all, large blank spaces exist on the history books in early Chechen history. Documentation begins to return in the 7th century with the arrival of the Khazars. The Khazars, who dominated much of the North Caucasus, included the Zerdiketian kingdom into their realm. Whether this overlordship was nominal or intense, it is hard to say. What we do know for certain is it ended in the 9th century, and by the 10th century, Georgian culture had begun to again seminate into the lands of Zerduketia. Christianity was adopted by the Zerduketians around this time, but it is worth bearing in mind even from Georgian sources, it was not widely popular, and likely trickled down from the aristocracy, as it had done in neighbouring Georgia. Whilst the Malt Kingdom was lost to the ages, the Princedom of Syria arose as a client state of Zerdiketia. Whilst the lives of Chechens was by no means peaceful at this point, this time does serve as a golden era of sorts. A time when the Chechens had a stable kingdom at peace with most of their neighbours. 
This, as I see it, is the twilight of the first epoch of Chechen history. In 1237, a Mongol force arrived in the Caucasus. As the Mongols ravaged neighbouring Alania, Chechen families who had lived there for generations were butchered, sent fleeing to the mountains. The Mongol invasion was in fact nothing more than a punitive raid, and the true Mongol force arrived the following year. 1238 marks a black year in Chechen history. Both Tzerdukatia and Malk were utterly destroyed, the small prince not sincere surviving only through pledging allegiance to this new invader. Chechens were slaughtered en masse, with those who could escaping to the inhospitable mountains. This invasion would forever change Chechen society and culture. Until this point, Chechen society had been largely feudal, much like neighbouring Georgia or even akin to the Greek city-states. This invasion led to the abandonment of the feudal system and the development of the Tip system. There are claims this system existed before the Mongol invasions, but I believe, with its emphasis on collective land ownership, egalitarianism, and obligations to both defend and band together in times of strife, stem from the pressure of having to live desperate lives in the highlands and mountains. This is a system that will play a huge role in Chechen history, as we will see. Another impact of the Mongol invasion was the evisceration of Christianity among the Chechens. Christianity, by this time, had not taken particularly deep roots in the Chechen people, and with the death of their aristocracy, so too did this foreign faith die. The Georgian influence in Chechen society, which too was manifest at the highest levels of society, was destroyed during this time as well, ending relations that had existed for at least a thousand years. Mongol domination of the lowlands kept Chechen society in the highlands and mountains, morphing and changing from what it once had been. But Chechen society did not live in isolation, and some Mongolian influence seeped into Chechen society, the two most widely known being the custom of Amanat, or exchanging hostages in diplomacy, and the folklore demon Almans, which translates as forest demon in Mongolian. But perhaps the most important influence that the Mongols had on Chechen society was to spur their conversion to Islam. The princes of Sincere converted to Islam at the behest of their Mongol overlords in the 14th century, becoming the first Muslim Chechens. The princedom of Sincere remained the last bastion of pre-Mongol Chechen culture and society, until the 14th century, when the Central Asian warlord Timurlane arrived, utterly destroying it. This led to the abolishment of the previous feudal-based system and the supremacy of the Tape system. The years of Mongol devastation were not just wrought on the Chechens, and pretty much the entirety of the lowlands of the Caucasus were depopulated during this time. As Mongol power and influence began to wane, Circassian, Kumik, and Nova settlers all began to encroach on what once had been Chechen lands. Despite their flight to the mountains, the Chechens refused to abandon their claims to land, and this began a period of intermittent low-level warfare in the North Central Caucasus. Although the Tip system allowed the Chechens to call upon greater numbers to help defend their claims to land, faced with three of the most warlike and powerful nations in the Caucasus, something else was needed. Thus, in the 15th century, the Chechens created a new, or perhaps old, concept, that of the Mechel, the National Council. Led by the Mechda, an elected leader from amongst the wisest and most powerful Chechen men, the various Tips began to band together into Tukums, occasionally with outsiders to repel invaders and hinder future threats. This would create a precedent that would help to keep Chechen lands remaining Chechen, fueled in no small measure by firearms brought by Ottoman and Persian missionaries and traders. This worked too for keeping expanding empires at bay as well mastering painful guerrilla warfare from their highland homes. Interestingly, this also marks another cementation of the division between Chechen and English. Faced with a Kabardian expansion to the west, the English chiefs were forced to band together into their own Tukums, relying little on other Chechen clans. A curious point about Chechen society at this time is, 
according to anthropologists and historians, has suggested that the egalitarianism of the Chechens was still not fully cemented at this time, and those living in the lowlands may still have followed a semi-feudal structure, even going so far as to invite foreign princes to rule them. In 1692, our first Russian records of the Chechens is made. According to Don Cossacks, who had been expanding southward to the fertile but underdepopulated Sunza River, they had been attacked by Chechens who prevented their safe settlement of the area. This was not the first time the Chechens had repelled a larger invasion force, as back in 1657, the Mehdar Geza had repelled an Avar incursion under Muhammad Khan. Of note, Muhammad Khan had declared a jihad against the Chechens at this time, suggesting that Islam was not deeply rooted in Chechen society. Both Ottoman and Persian missionaries have been travelling to the region since at least the 15th century, but the egalitarianism, traditional and independent nature of the Chechens made conversion difficult. What was needed was a binding cause, a reason for many to convert, and that reason came from the north. In 1735, ambassadors from Russia arrived in the northern part of modern Chechnya, bringing gifts of silver and steel. An arrangement was made where land, occupied by Russian Cossacks, would be returned to two Tiths in return for pledges of loyalty to the Tsar. This arrangement was revisited in 1781, with a growing Russian presence in the Caucasus. A single Tip pledged loyalty to the Tsar, and this decision was not ratified with the Mechel. By this point, the Russian encroachment was becoming more and more evident, with regular running battles along the Sunza River between Cossack settlers and the Chechens. It was perhaps this that led the Chechen leader, Sheikh Mansur, to raise the flag of war. Sheikh Mansur was a Chechen, but had travelled to Dagestan to learn more about Islam and his youth. Returned to Chechnya, he had rallied the Tiks and chastised them for clinging to their ancient Vainic faith. He promoted Islam as the brotherly religion of the people of the Caucasus, and in 1785, a Russian force of 5,000 was sent to capture this agitator. Failing to find him, the Russian troops burned his village of Aldi, which served as tinder for the Chechens, commanding a force of around 12,000 made up of Chechens, Dagestanis, Circassians and even Nogai, he waged war against the Cossacks and Russian troops in the Caucasus, prompting a defensive withdrawal by the Russians to the Terek River. Though captured in 1791, Sheikh Mansur laid some very important seeds in Chechen society. Growing Islam among the population and to this day is revered as a national hero. Whilst being a symbol of Chechen resistance to Russian encroachment, he would also serve as another symbol of something far more tragic to afflict the Chechen population. Deportation to the mines and tundra of Siberia. The year 1817 saw Russian forces mobilised for a concentrated effort to conquer the length and breadth of the Caucasus, from the Adigia lands in the west to the Lesgian lands in the east. Naturally, this included Chechnya, and the fierce resistance of the Chechens prompted the Russians to bring General Yomolov to bear mass executions, villages razed to the ground, and indiscriminate cannon fire were all employed against the Chechens in an attempt to break their spirit and resolve. This, as you might expect, had the complete opposite effect. In 1840, several Chechen Tukhums were made with the Avar leader Imam Shamil, something helped by the spread of Sufism during the 1820s across the Caucasus. Though again chastised for their irreligiosity and still remnant paganism, the Chechens served under Shamil as hardy and fierce warriors preventing any real Russian advance into Chechnya. This influence spread further with the philosophy of Mirodism among the Chechens, as well as conventional Sunni Islam. Ultimately though, Russian efforts to conquer the Caucasus were doubled, and through gradual attrition, the Chechen forces were worn down. Much like the Circassians to the west, the Chechens faced a bleak choice. To surrender meant disarmament and disenfranchisement, having to eke out a living on the worst soil in the highlands if allowed to stay at all. To fight meant near certain death, not only for them, but for their entire team. 
the women and children too. As did the Circassians, whose own story mirrors the Chechen experience of this time. Many Chechens opted for exile, fleeing south to the Ottoman Empire, where around 40,000 Chechens were resettled. The Caucasian War had brought a terrible toll on the Chechen people, and of an estimated half a million Chechens living in the Caucasus in 1840, only around 140,000 were left by 1861. Despite being defeated and having much of their land parceled out to the hated Cossacks, the Chechens were not a defeated people and embraced their new religion with zeal. Failed uprisings occurred sporadically throughout the 1860s, spurred by the Kadri movement that gripped many Muslims in the Caucasus at that time. When, in 1877, the Turks invaded, many Chechen warriors rose up to act as a fifth column. As stated in our Dagestan video, these uprisings were suppressed with extreme prejudice. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Chechens were in a far worse position than they had been a century earlier. Uprisings in 1898 and 1904 against Russian rule were brutally suppressed and left the Chechens disenfranchised, estranged and spread out thinly over the mountains. Chechens were not at this time brought to civil courts, but instead brought to military tribunals, regardless of the crime. In pretty much every respect, they lived an alternative, lesser existence to their Cossack counterparts. That said, Chechen culture continued to exist, and it eked out a space amongst this overwhelming Russian influence. Religious schools remained open, and there was no official ban on the Chechen language or cultural traditions. Exemption from national service on grounds of unreliability left the Chechens able to recuperate and swell their numbers, exempted from the Russian wars of aggression. With the outbreak of the First World War and subsequent Bolshevik Revolution, Chechen society stood at a precarious angle. Their long-standing enemies, the Cossacks, had had a strong presence in Czechia since the 1860s, and as Russian society tore itself apart, tit for tat attacks and killings resumed. In this anarchy, the Tib system, which was very much losing its traditional role in Chechen society even now, was further pressed upon, as Chechens fought for the Tsar, for the Revolution, for the Mountain Republic, for the Islamic Emirate, and for themselves. An interesting note here that whilst Chechen men were exempted from national service, once that ban was lifted post-1916, many did volunteer to fight. Because the Cossacks had largely aligned their future with the white movement of the Russian Civil War, when the Bolshevik victory looked imminent, many Chechens were initially relieved, promised national autonomy, freedom of religion, and investment from the state. The Chechens, like many people from the Caucasus, originally welcomed cooperation with the Bolsheviks. This would prove to be something of a mistake. The first rumbles of discontent emerged in 1920, when the demands of war communism were put upon the Chechen people more fully. This led to rebellions in 1920, as well as 1923, they both were mercilessly suppressed by the Red Army. This in turn led many Chechen guerrillas to head to the mountains to continue their uprising, establishing a long tradition during Soviet administration. The Chechens again rose up in 1929 at the collectivization of their land with little success. This was followed five years later by the creation of the Chechen Ingus SSR, with healthy portions of Russian dominated land included for good measure. This was, in part, to act as a counterweight to Chechen unreliability and to help secure the area in the eyes of the state. But early Soviet rule was not entirely bad. With the de of the state, land was given to Chechens and investment in the important Chechen gas and oil fields led to Grozny developing further into an important centre of commerce. As Soviet citizens, Chechens were, for the first time, included in the oil and gas industry, and employment rose dramatically. Soviet education too was implemented even in the most remote Chechen villages, with literacy reaching 80% by 1940. There had been sporadic banditry in Chechnya since the 1920s, but with the failure of the Winter War against Finland, the enforcement of collectivization, and the random nature of the purges, it prompted brothers Hassan and Hussein Israelov to begin leading a small insurgency against the Soviet state. Their aim, total secession. 
By 1941 and the German invasion, this had swelled to around 5,000 people, launching unconnected attacks on Chechen and Russian villages. This was incredibly damaging for the Chechen people and was later used as justification for their deportation. This is of course completely unfair, particularly so when you bear in mind that eight times this number actually volunteered to fight in the Red Army, fighting and dying for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Whilst the Nazis never actually entered the borders of modern Chechnya, they did get very near to it, at great cost to the people of the USSR, notably Chechens. On the 23rd of February 1944, something extraordinary was inflicted upon the Chechen people, the Ardahar. For weeks before this, NKVD troops had been appearing in the valley and gorges across the Chechen English Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. These troops had been billeted with Chechen families and were exclusively non-Chechens themselves. Due to the fact that the Germans had got within spitting distance of Grozny, the legacy of Chechen resistance against the Soviet Union since the 1920s, as well as the paranoia of Joseph Stalin, the Chechens as a people were deemed to be enemies of the state and traitors to the Soviet Union. In a week-long operation, every man, woman and child was forced onto transports and deported from their native land. Those who could not get onto the cattle trains in time were shot, such as in the Haibak massacre, whilst returning Chechen Red Army soldiers who had fought for the Union were disarmed, bundled into carts and deported to the deserts of Central Asia too. There were no exceptions. Numbers are a little hard to get a concrete figure for. By their own Soviet census, 407,690 Chechens lived in the Chechen English Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic in 1939. The official Soviet report stated 1,272 deaths, whilst more recent investigation has suggested a much higher figure. Modern research into this catastrophe has estimated around 30% of those who were deported died en route. This would mean over 100,000 men women and children suffocated, starved and died in agony on the way to Central Asia. Around 240,000 Chechens were dumped in Kazakhstan, 71,000 in Kyrgyzstan and the rest scattered across Central Asia and Siberia. Chechen history is full of tragedy, yet the Adahar is perhaps the single most devastating thing to happen to the Chechen people. It is little wonder that many view this including the European Parliament, as genocide. In the desolate deserts of Central Asia, the Chechens had no friends, no allies, but each other. Almost immediately, Chechens were protesting and rallying against their deportation, calling for their return to their ancient lands. Whilst away from their ancient lands, many turned to religion for comfort, and a degree of religious renewal occurred amongst the Chechens, aided by the fact they were surrounded by fellow Muslim nations. Chechen society grew self-reliant, insular, and apart from the wider Soviet influence surrounding it. Access to higher education was forbidden, and there were few, if any, opportunities for Chechens to learn Russian, the lingua franca of the Soviet Union. In 1957, Nikita Khrushchev's rehabilitation bill was passed by the Soviet Council, allowing the Chechen people to return to their ancestral lands. Chechens had been trying to return home almost immediately after their deportation, but had been consistently turned back. Now, over 50,000 families made their way home, but many did not. Having made a new existence from scratch over the last 13 years, many Chechens saw no point in returning and stayed in their respective settlements. These communities would directly go on to form the diasporas in modern Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. The influx of Chechens returning to Chechnya caused problems for those living there at the time. Having been allotted Chechen farms, houses and territory, numerous incidents and disputes emerged as Chechen families returned home only to find their homes taken. The lack of procedure, employment and sufficient support by the state led to many Chechens being forced to build new homes elsewhere, in the lowlands and on the worst available land. This culminated in the 1958 Grozny riots, where Chechens and Slavic communities started attacking each other, irrespective of who actually started the violence. 
The result was an unofficial ban on Chechens in the Soviet system. Despite being rehabilitated, they were refused public office, denied access to higher education, and forced to work the most menial jobs. Many Chechen men and women would travel back to Central Asia during the harvest season to earn a little extra money at this time. A side effect of having this Chechen diaspora in Central Asia. Unrest was documented in Chechnya well into the 1960s, when the demographics began to shift in favour of the Chechens. This in turn was accompanied by all the hallmarks of a police state. Curfews, news blackouts and travel restrictions. By the late 1980s, Chechen society had transformed, or rather reverted on itself. Chechens were in power in a few lower level, but still important, positions in both the government and army. By 1989, they made up over half the population of Chechnya and watched the unrest that was happening in the rest of the Soviet Union with great interest. Simultaneously, with growing numbers came growing demands and a growing disillusionment with the system that had persecuted them for so long. In 1989, the first Chechen leader of the Chechen English Autonomous Soviet Republic was elected due to enormous public demand and from there, things began to unravel. In line with Glasnost, in 1988, the Popular Front had formed to oppose Soviet plans to destroy the ecology of part of Chechnya for profit. This quickly turned into a nationalist party, with louder Chechen voices calling for a separation with the Soviet Union. These calls had always existed, since the earliest days of the Soviet Union, but had historically been quashed quickly. With Glasnost, force was not being used, and so the message began to spread. 1990 saw the Chechen National Congress, established with the Mekher, set up the following year to resolve tribal disputes. The Chechen National Congress raised the Chechen English Autonomous Soviet Republic to a fully fledged republic, and the following year, the Chechens amicably split from the English segment of their shared republic. This was explored and explained in our video on the Republic of English Chechia, which you can check out over here if you haven't. But to briefly recap, the reason for the split stemmed from the fact that the English, having claims against other republics in the now Russian Federation, did not want to jeopardize those claims by declaring independence. The Chechens were happy to do so. The next few years of Chechen history were a whirlwind of elation and tragedy. And other channels have done a fantastic job of explaining what exactly happened during those years. So here, we're not going to focus on what happened so much, as we're going to focus on how it affected the Chechen people. Since 1989, Chechens had been returning in larger numbers from abroad, and this spurred on the calls for independence. When independence came in 1991, the Chechen people rejoiced. After over a hundred years, once again, they were an independent nation. And despite an economic blockade from Russia, many Chechens still see this time as a golden one. Despite calls from the Mekher to establish Islam as the state religion, the Chechen state, led by Zokhar Dodaev, was established as a secular democracy and managed to oust the Russian troops sent to cower them. Nevertheless, changes to Chechen society were beginning to occur. With the Slavic population leaving in droves in the face of economic stagnation, and unofficial discrimination. These factors helped to create instability in Chechnya, and Adayev engaged bitterly with his political rivals, some of whom sought a more subservient position in relation to Russia. On the 11th of December 1994, many Chechens awoke to the news that they had been invaded by the old enemy. Using their terrain to their advantage, the Chechen army, who had gained experience fighting urban combat in the Abkhazian War, retreated to the hills and surrounded mountains, allowing Grozny to become a death trap for the Russians. Thousands fled to neighboring English Etia or further afield as the encroaching Russian soldiers rampaged. The fact that these troops were ill-disciplined and under-equipped led to the development of several war crimes committed by the Russian soldiers upon the Chechen civilian population. This in turn led to a growing no-quarter approach to captured Russian soldiers. Despite winning the First Chechen War, it left profound scars on Chechen society. Thousands of Chechens had fled, thousands more killed in the fighting. Dudayev was dead, and many moderate Chechens 
had become radicalized in their thinking. One of the few official supports for Chechnya at this time were radical Islamic groups such as the Mujahideen. The economic blockade imposed by Russia, lack of foreign support, underlying religious issues, opposition between the Mehke and various warlords who had arisen, coupled with the fact that nearly all Chechens who had stayed were now armed veterans, led to Chechnya becoming a very unstable place indeed. When the second war came to Chechnya, much like the first one had, it led to a scattering of the Chechen people. The combined arms approach of Russia levelled Grozny, and thousands fled to the countryside and abroad. The fact that the war had been started by dissident religious fanatics tarred Chechen nationalists, even though they were unrelated, and brought about the end of an independent Vichkeria. Abroad, Chechens were now not seen as refugees, but as potential terrorists, fundamentalists, and dangerous elements in society. As the Chechen diaspora were sometimes unable to effectively integrate into the local societies around them, the Chechen diaspora maintained their internal links, relying, as always, on each other. With the war over and several warlords switching to support Russia, a new era of Chechnya dawned. The rise of the Kadyrov family to power heralded the end of true independence and the beginning of a relationship between Moscow and Grozny, peace in return for autonomy. As a part of the Russian Federation, peace would reign with Spetsnaz officers conducting an array of operations to clear the jihadist and Islamist elements from Chechnya and Dagestan. Money flowed into this new Russian Republic, and slowly, those Chechens who had fled to neighboring regions returned. The rising birth rate of the Chechen people and the diaspora returning to Chechnya has certainly helped the population. As of the last census, the population of Chechnya was near pre-war levels, providing jobs, security, investment, and protecting Chechen culture and tradition, the Kadyrov cannot be claimed to not be helping the Chechen people. That said, there was another side to Kadyrovite rule. Chechens, both at home and abroad, have not been safe from speaking their mind on matters of state and religion. Honor killings and assassinations are not unheard of in Chechen society, and those living in Chechnya are heavily encouraged to dress modestly. Well, at least the women are. Freedom of speech is heavily curtailed, and homosexuality utterly forbidden. This is enforced through a traditional honour code called the Konakala. Whilst not all Chechens follow this code, the community pressure both within Chechnya and amongst the diaspora to do so can be quite overwhelming. That said, Chechen culture is not just limited to vendettas and prohibitions. The Chechens are musical people, and many folk songs, some dating back hundreds of years, are still played on instruments such as the fanda, a lute-esque instrument popular in both Chechnya and Ingushetia. Whilst they, nearly all Chechens, at least nominally, are Muslim, their songs offer a glimpse into their pre-Islamic past, often referring to famous victories and heroes of Vainic mythology. Some elements of this mythology is similar to other Caucasian peoples, such as the Circassians and Georgians. But features of Chechen folklore include the Almaz, a monster of the forest. Batia Shurko, a being that could cross into the realm of the dead for a small sacrifice. And Tarams, spirits that would protect their beholden. As before stated, most Chechens are Sunni Muslims. Whilst there are small communities of both Christian and atheist Chechens, they are few and far between caught between the dual pressures of the state and the Konakala. Sufism too is discouraged, in place of what Kadyrov defines as traditional Islam, though it should be mentioned that more fundamentalist interpretations of Islam such as Wahhabism is actively discouraged in the wider Chechen community and actively persecuted in Chechnya. Whilst songs of their pre-Islamic past have survived, many of the holidays have not, and today Pretty much all of the official holidays that Chechens celebrate are traditional Islamic ones, such as Eid and Ramadan. Chechen national dress is very representative of the Caucasian style. Traditional menswear consists of a tunic called a polokaftan, overlaying with a shirt bearing gazernitsi or ammunition pockets. A burka or felt cloak is a necessary addition, and many adorn their outfits with Astrahan style caps and boots of strong leather. 
These clothes are all made out of wool, fur and leather, traditional materials in the Caucasus mountains. Women's wear is more elaborate, with an underdress overlaying with a tighter, more figure-hugging dress, a jewel-adorned belt and, importantly, an Islamic-style shawl or hijab. These can come in an array of colours and traditionally older women would wear more beige and neutral colours whilst younger women would wear more colourful ones. As with most traditional clothing, it is worn pretty much exclusively on special occasions, such as festivals and weddings. The Chechens are of course a modern people, and thus they wear modern clothing, although as mentioned earlier, are heavily encouraged to dress modestly, or at least the women are. Chechens also have a long culinary tradition, and boast some of the most appetising food in the Caucasus. Among these are the Hingalj, a pumpkin and butter pie, along with the siska, a fried cornbread snack. Interestingly, the Chechen take on the Persian dessert helva, the demi helva, serves as a centerpiece for most large dinners. The Chechens are perhaps the most infamous and misunderstood people of the Russian Federation. Boasting a long and proud history, the Chechens today are a scattered people, many forced to live abroad for fear of danger, fear of change, the fear of the unknown. Yet despite the numerous attempts to destroy their culture and history, they have managed to cling to it, proving themselves as one of the most resilient people of the Russian Federation. My name is Andrew and thank you for watching. Up next are the Chukchi. Paka!